and starting. Hey, greetings, Michael DDA here. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me. Uh, we are again continuing our adventure in Torah. Don't you just love it? You know, having Yasher be a part of our study gives so much more depth of what it's like to be a part of Yehovah's kingdom. You know, we don't, we see the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, we think Jesus for heaven's sakes. We don't even know. We're so blinded by the doctrines and traditions of men and being able to go through Genesis like we are right now and seeing Yasher currently with it. This pulls so much more together. It makes me feel like the scriptures, the Torah has been cut. I'm going to be nice. It's been messed with. Things have potentially been removed that we don't know about. And they all seem to do with things about Jacob and Abraham and Isaac and their people. It's, it's, it's terrible what, what we're seeing happening. And the amount that is being left out is significant. For example, three weeks ago, we went through Genesis 35. Jacob and his sons had just fled from Shechem. Thanks, Wes. Had just fled from Shechem and the, oh, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. And the um, Amorites were getting ready to come against them. 10,000 of them. And they were held back by a prayer, really by Yehovah, but he answered the prayer of Isaac and Jacob, saying, turn their counselors away from doing wickedness and coming after Jacob's sons. Remember, they were, the eldest was 13 at that time. No, he, I guess he was maybe 14. That would have been uh, Reuben. Uh, Simeon and Levi were 13 and 12 when they took out Shechem, 600 men. All they said was, uh, where is it? The terror of Elohim, verse 5. The terror of Elohim, you know, I'm going to make this big. The terror of Elohim was upon the cities that were all around them. That's all it says. We spent an entire week of them talking about remembering what happened to Abraham with Nimrod and his very furnace and all the 800,000 that came down, how Jacob was protected from Laban and then Esau. And they said, and we saw it with our eyes. Well, they took the better part of discretion and did not go after Jacob's seed. So, again, not last week, not the week before, the week before that. We saw that Jacob and his seed came to Hebron. Here it is right here. And Jacob came to his father, Isaac, at Mamre. Remember, that's the tree, the Mamre's tree, that one that stood up, that very right big tree. Everybody knows that. The tree at Mamre, which is Gerges Arba, which is Hebron. This is the home base for Isaac and for uh, Jacob for so long. Uh, Esau lived there for a long time, as did Abraham. But from 27 to 28, it says, now the days of Isaac were 180 years old. So here we are, Jacob at 100. Now it's Isaac's at 180. That means that Jacob is 120. What happened to 20 years? 
Well, we are finding out what happened to 20 years. We saw it last week. That was one day at Jacob being 105 years old. And we saw in one day them take out at least two cities and maybe even three cities. I think they did, did three and they just didn't really talk about it fully. But they killed 20,000 men in the first battle. Then they started taking out the cities. You don't make war against Yehovah's seed. You're going to lose. And I think, dare I say, this is a precedent, a shadow picture, if you will, of future events that are going to happen when Yehovah returns, the great day of Yehovah. We're going to see it in the future. We're going to talk about it here in a minute. Well, one of the things we talked about last week was whether it's, it's a, it always says the sons of Jacob in Yasher. So we don't really know if it's B'nai Jacob or Benim Jacob. And I think last week I said sons of Jacob or Jacob's sons. There's no definite article, so it's not the, the anything. It's Jacob's sons. But I think I'm wrong because I think it's supposed to be Jacob's seed. It says, B'nai Yaakov. I wish I had the Yasher, the Hebrew Yasher. I don't have it. Even if I had, I'd have a hard time finding my spot in it. There are no verses. But the reason I say that is right here in verse 22 of Genesis 35. Look what it says. It says, uh, now Jacob's seed were 12. Here it is, Jacob's bene. This does not say benim. This says bene. This is bene. This is generations of men. They just happen to be the start of the generations, the seed of Jacob. But if it were to say sons, I mean, sons would be fine. But it doesn't say sons. It doesn't say Benim Yaakov. It says Benay Yaakov. Big difference. And because it says that, then it does, talks about the, the sons that came from Leah, the sons that came from Rachel and Bilhah and Zilpah. So we're going to say Jacob's seed today because that is what they are. Benay Yaakov. Now, before we go there, again, this is a little bit of a review from what we did last week. Joel chapter 1 is talking about, for the day of Yehovah is coming, for it is at hand. This is the, the shadow picture of coming events coming on the world. Look what it says. Tell me if this doesn't sound like what we saw last week and what we're going to see this week. Remember last week, the very first battle, it says the sun was darkened and the earth shook. Watch how this ends. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Blow the shofar. In Zion, remember Zion is not has nothing to do with Zionists. Get that out of your mind. We're they've stolen our name. We're talking about righteous, spiritually born men, probably men that are being raised from the dead and coming on the earth right right now with what's going on with the great day of Yahovah, as well as the men who have already made covenant that are still alive. Blow the trumpet so far in Zion. Sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of Yehovah is coming. 
that doesn't say the Lord. Get that out of your mind. When you have capital letters, it's covering up Yahweh's name. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What's his name? We don't even know. It's Yahovah. What he says, he does. For the day of Yahovah is coming. It is at hand. A, a day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Yahovah is in the clouds. Like the morning clouds spread over the mountains, a people come great and strong, the like of whom have never been, nor will there ever be such after them, even for many successive generations. The fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like a garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Who shall escape them? Oh, it's going to change the landscape. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like swift steeds, so they run. With the noise like chariots, over mountaintops they leap. Like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. Before them, a people writhe in pain. All faces are drained of color. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in, in formation and they do not break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro on, in the city. They run on the wall. They climb the houses. They climb into the houses. They enter the windows like a thief. The earth shakes before them. There it is, the shaking of the earth. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon grow dark. The stars diminish in their brightness. Yehovah gives voice before his army. His camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes his words. For the day of Yehovah is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Well, keep this in mind as we talk about the feats that Jacob's seed are going to perform today in taking out these last five cities, four or five cities. I'm going to begin here in. Yasher. We're going to turn to Yasher. Whoops, that's not it. This is the one I want right here. And remember, shadow picture. The thing that has been is that which will be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said? See, this is new. It's already been in ancient times before us. We just don't know it because it's been hidden from us. Who out there would want to hide people from understanding how great Yehovah is and how he can provide for his people? I could think of somebody, some people. Well, let's begin. And the sons, no, and Jacob's seed went from the city of Sartan. They, I'm sorry, and when Jacob's seed went from the city of Sartan, they had gone about 200 cubits, 300 feet, a football field, when they met the inhabitants of Tupnak coming after them. For they went out to fight with them because they had smitten the king of Topnock and all his men. That was in the first battle. And all, and all 
that remained of the city of Tabna came out to fight with Jacob's seed. And they thought to retake from them the booty, that's the animals, and the people that they took with them, and the spoil, that's all the goods that they took from the city, which they had captured from Kazar, Kazar, and Sartan. And the rest of the men of Tabnak fought with Jacob's seed in that place. And Jacob's seed smote them. And they fled before them, and they pursued them to the city of Arbalan. And they all fell before the sons of Jacob. So this Tabnak, they didn't even go into Tabnak. It didn't seem like it uh, until they're going to go get the booty. Let's find out. And they all fell before Jacob's seed. And Jacob's seed returned and came to Tabnak. Now here they are returning, it says, and came to Tabnak. And to take away the spoil of Tabnak, which when they came to Tabnak, they heard that the people of Arbalan had gone out to meet them to save the spoil of their brethren. And Jacob's seed left ten men there in Tabnak to plunder the city. And they went out towards the people of Arbalan. Keep in mind how many are representing Jacob's seed. We're talking about ten sons and they started with a hundred and two servants and Jacob. So they started with 113 men. They lost three of their servants in the first day of battle. They're not going to lose anyone else. It's just they're going to be 110 men, counting Jacob, that is fighting all these cities. They went out towards the people of Arbalan. And the men of Arbalan went out with their women to fight with Jacob's seed. For their women were experienced in battle. They went out about 400 men and women. You know, in Yehovah's kingdom, you never, ever have a woman fighting battles. Yehovah won't be with us if a woman is fighting battles because she'd be in her menses, she's unclean. And it's going to make the whole rest of the camp unclean. It's going to happen. You see memes with women in armor and holding a sword or a spear or a shield. Fake. This has nothing to do with Yehovah's ways. Women don't kill men. Women don't kill even animals, from what I've seen in, in Yehovah's word. It's the men's duty to do that. They may clean them, but they don't kill them. Now, we've learned lies. We make women men. Women are men. They have different duties and responsibilities before Yehovah than men do. But the Canaanites, they have their women fighting with them. The U.S. United States Army has their women fighting with them. This is not Yehovah's kingdom. Let me start again. And the men of Arbalan went with their women to fight with Jacob's seed, for their women were experienced in battle. And they went out, about 400 men and women. And Jacob's seed shouted with a loud voice, and they all ran towards the inhabitants of Arbalan with a great and tremendous voice. Look at that. They shouted. Jacob's seed shouted. You know, think about this. We're seeing these men jump great distances. We're seeing huge strength. Remember, Jacob takes up a rock and knocks a guy off his horse. The, the strongest Amalekite that there is knocked him right off his horse. Did they know they had this strength? Did they know that they could shout and bring fear into people? Will we, as Yehovah's Ezra men in the latter days, have this ability also? I 
I wonder. Jacob's seat shouted with a loud voice, and they all ran towards the inhabitants of Arbalan, and with a great and tremendous voice, and the, with a great and tremendous voice, and the inhabitants of Arbalan heard the noise of the shouting of Jacob's seed. And they're roaring like the noise of a lion's. And like the roaring of the sea and its waves. You know, this is not, this, this is happening again. Look at here. This is in Isaiah talking about latter days. He will lift up his banner to the nations from afar and will whistle to them from the ends of the earth. Surely they shall come speedily, swiftly. But no one will be weary or stumble among them. This is Jehovah's people. No one's going to be weary or stumble among them. No one will slumber or sleep, nor will the belt of their loins be loosened, nor the strap of their sandals be broken, whose arrows are sharp and their bows bent. Their horse hooves will seem like flint and their wheels like whirlwinds. Their roaring will be like a lion. They will roar like a young lion. Yes, they will roar and take hold of the prey. There's the, the roaring. They will carry it away safely and no one will deliver. In that day, they will roar against them like the roaring of the sea. There it is again. And if one looks to the land, behold, darkness and sorrow. And the light is darkened by the clouds. I think this is Jehovah returning in his clouds in the latter days. Well, we'll save the rest of that for another day. Yeah, we'll save it forever. We read it before. I read it last week, in fact. Roaring like land of the sea, and the fear and terror possessed their hearts on account of Jacob's seed. And they were terribly afraid of them, and they retreated and fled before them into the city. And Jacob's seed pursued them to the gate of the city, and they came upon them in the city. Jacob's seed fought with them in the city, and all their women were engaged in slinging against Jacob's seed. And the combat was very severe against them the whole of that day until evening. This is the second day. And the sons of Yaakov could not pre prevail over them. And I said the sons. Jacob's seed could not prevail over them. And Jacob's seed was al almost perished in that battle. And Jacob's seed cried unto Jehovah and greatly gained strength when they did. Towards evening, and Jacob's seed smote all the inhabitants of Arbalan by the edge of the sword, men, women, and children. You have the men fighting, or you have the women fighting. They got to kill the men or kill the women. And then they have to get rid of the kids because the kids are going to be orphans again. No, it's, they are not helping themselves. So this is the fourth city. And we already saw the third city. Here it is right here. And also the remainder of the people who had fled from Sartan, Jacob's seat smote them in Arbalan. And the sons of Jacob did unto Arvalon and Tabnak. Tabnak was the second, a third city that they destroyed, uh, as they had done to Kazar and Sartan. And when the women saw that all the men were dead, they went upon the roofs of the city and smote Jacob's seed by showering them down stones, showering down stones like rain. They're using slingshots to, to, to take out the, the sons that are trying to. And Jacob's seed hastened and came into the city, seized all the women and smote them with the edge of the sword. And Jacob's seed captured the spoil and the booty. There's the booty, flocks and herds and cattle didn't take any prisoners. Prisoners would be booty. Spoil is the gemstones and the silver and the gold. And Jacob's seed, though this was uh this was the fifth city coming up right now. And Jacob's Jacob's seed did unto Mach 
Maknaima, as they had done to Topnak and Tazar and to Shiloh. You know, they haven't mentioned Shiloh yet. So now they're mentioning Maknaima. That's one of the kings. But when they say Shiloh, I thought, well, maybe Maknaima was Shiloh. It apparently isn't because they're doing it separate here. When did they do Shiloh? I can't see that they ever did. Here, if I go back to Shiloh, I can I can do a quick search. Whoops, I don't want to go there. Uh, I can get back to it very easily. Here's Shiloh. I can go back to where I was right now. There it is. But if I backtrack on Shiloh, here's what I get. Ikuri, king of Shiloh, was dead. The four remaining kings fled from their station. Here's the one before that. And Ikuri of Shiloh came to assist Elam. Here's the last one. And these are the four kings, or the seven kings that came against. One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven kings. Uh, and these are the kings that they're battling right now. Sartan, uh, Tabnak, Gaash, we're going to do it today. Shiloh, it doesn't seem like we ever did. Kazar, we did last week. Sartan, we did last week. Laban, uh, Beth Karan, we're going to do this week. And, uh, Shavar, Shavir, where's Shavir? Shavir, Kavir, Shavir, uh, King of At, At Nema, At Nema. Could this be At Nema? Could this be the one that we're talking about right now? Um, uh, what was it? So let me go back. Here it is, uh, Maknema, maybe? Atnema, Maknema? Maybe, maybe it's the same city. Um, so here's Shiloh. They did the same to Maknema as they had done to Topnak Kazar and to Shiloh. And they turned from there and went away. Again, Shiloh is just not mentioned. And on the fifth day, Jacob's seed, fifth day, they're already up to the fifth day. Jacob's seed heard that the people of Gaash had gathered against them for battle. Can you imagine? They're not hardly getting any sleep at all. We saw that last week in the battle between the first two cities that Levi almost had his hand cut off. So he is in a situation where he's got to be hurting greatly right now. But he's still fighting. He's still in the battle. We're going to see him jump on walls. And on the fifth day, Jacob's seed heard that the people of Gaash, let me slide this over just a little bit, people of Gaash had gathered against them to battle because they had slain their king and their captains. For there had been 14 captains in the city of Gosh, and Jacob's seed, Jacob's seed had slain them all in the first battle. Yeah, they knocked a lot of guys out. Remember, 20,000 people fell in that first battle. 20,000 men fell in that first battle. And Jacob's seed that day girt on their weapons of war, and they marched to battle against the inhabitants of Gosh. And in Gaash, there was a very strong and mighty people of the people of the Amorites. And Gaash was the strongest and best fortified city of all the cities of the Amorites. It had three walls. How tall were these walls? Last week, we saw that one was 75 feet high and Jacob scaled it. One jump, not Jacob. Um, Judah, Judah scaled it. He's going to do it today. This is the most fortified. How high is this wall? How high is the wall behind it? They said three walls. I never saw three walls. So let me continue. And Jacob seemed came to Gosh. And they found the gates of the city locked and 500 men standing on the top of the outermost wall and a people numerous as the sands of the seashore 
were in ambush for Jacob's seed from without the city at the rear thereof. Remember, Jacob only has a hundred people, counting himself, that are fighting. And the sons are doing most of the fighting. And Jacob's seed approached to open the gate of the city whilst they were drawing nigh. And whilst they were drawing nigh, behold, those who were in ambush at the rear of the city came forth from their places to surround Jacob's seed. So this is the number of the sands of the seashore. Remember the last time they talked about sands of the seashore, it was at least 10,000 men. Uh, the second time it was 20,000 men. There's a lot of people here. Surrounded Jacob's seed. Maybe they just didn't have time to go. It was a lot. And Jacob's seed were enclosed between the people of Gaash. And the battle was both to their front and rear. And all the men that were upon the wall were casting from the wall upon them arrows and stones. And Judah seeing that the men of Gaash were getting too heavy for them, gave a most piercing and tremendous shriek. And all the men of Gaash were terrified at the voice of Judah's cry. And men fell from the wall at the powerful shriek. It's a teruah, a great shout. And all those that were from without and within the city were greatly afraid for their lives. And Jacob's seed still came nigh to break the door of the city. When the men of Gaash threw stones and arrows upon them from the top of the wall and made them flee from the gate. And Jacob's seed returned against the men of Gaash who were with them from without the city. He's going after the, the, the innumerable ones. And they smote them terribly as, as striking against gourds. And they could not stand against Jacob's seed for fright. And terror had seized them at the shriek of Judah. Wow! You know, was this some frequency? Specific frequency that Judah could hit in the scream that terrified people so much? I wonder. And Jacob's seed slew all those men who were without the city. And Jacob's seed still drew nigh to effect an entrance into the city and to fight under the city walls. But they could not, for all the inhabitants of Gaash who remained in the city had surrounded the walls of Gaash in every direction, so that Jacob's seed were unable to approach the, approach to the city to fight for them. And the sons of Jacob came nigh to the other corner, to one corner, to fight under the wall. And the inhabitants of, the, of Gaash threw arrows and stones upon them like showers of rain, and they fled from under the wall. And the people of Gaash, who were upon the wall, seeing that Jacob's seed could not prevail over them from under the wall, reproached Jacob's seed in these words, saying, they're going to reproach Jacob's seed. What is matter with you? in the battle that you cannot prevail. Can you then do unto, can you, can you then do unto the mighty city of Gaash and its inhabitants as you did to the cities of the Amorites that were not so powerful? Surely to those weak ones among us, you did those things and slew them in the entrance of their city. For they had no strength when they were terrified at the sound of your shouting. There it is, the shouting again. And will you now then be able to fight in this place? Surely here you will all die, and we will avenge the cause of those cities that you have laid waste. And the inhabitants of Gaash greatly reproached Jacob's seed and reviled them with their Elohim. Their lawmakers and judges. 
and continued to cast arrows and stones upon them from the wall. And Judah and his brothers. Remember, Judah is kind of the, if you will, the king of the brothers. You know, here's something to think about. Uh, Judah got the kingship. Levi got the kind of the religious. And Joseph got the uh, the spiritual leadership, if you will, when Jacob took it away from Reuben because he had slept with Bilhah. Now, let me ask you a question. Where is Reuben in all of this? I have not seen his name mentioned once. Why is that? We're going to see all the sons are involved except Benjamin and Joseph. They're back at home with their mom. I think being the son of his old age, Joseph, Jacob's old age, Jacob wants to keep him safe. He's not fighting. The other kids are. Where is Reuben? Why is he not involved? So, a Judah was jealous for his Elohim in this matter, and he called out and said, Oh, Yehovah, help! Send help! Send help to us and our brothers! Help to us and our brothers! Us. Is just Judah, his... Judah's servants that are with Judah at that time and his brothers. Maybe that's what it means. And he ran at a distance with all his might, with his drawn sword in his hand, and he sprang from the earth and by dint of his strength mounted the wall and his sword fell from his hand. He just jumped to the top of the wall. They can't get through the door. Yet, because of what is raining down on top of them right now, the arrows and the stones. And all the men that were upon the wall were terrified. And some of them fell from the wall into the city. Oh, Judah shouted upon the wall once he got up there. He dropped his sword. He's unarmed. But he still shouts. They were terrified. Some of them fell from the wall into, into the city and died. And those that were yet upon the wall, when they saw Judah's strength, they were greatly afraid and fled for their lives into the city for safety. And some were emboldened to fight with Judah upon the wall. And they came nigh to slay him when he saw that there, when they saw that there was no sword in Judah's hand. And they thought of casting him from the wall to his brothers. And 20 men of the city, 20 men, came to assist them. And they surrounded Judah and they all shouted over him and reproached him with drawn swords. And they terrified Judah. And Judah cried out to his brothers from the wall. And, and Jacob and his Sons, sons, I think that's okay here. It's his sons. That would be fine. Drew the bow from under the wall and smote three of the men. So there's 20 and I got down to 17 that were upon the wall, on top of the wall. And Judah continued to cry and exclaimed, Oh, Yehovah, help us. Oh, Yehovah, deliver us. And he cried out with a loud voice upon the wall, and the cry was heard at a great distance. And after his cry, he again repeated to shout. And all the men surrounded Judah on the top of the wall were terrified. And each threw his sword from his hand at the sound of Judah's shouting, and his, there it is, tremor and flat. His tremor, his tremor, does that sound like a frequency? Is a shout? 
Is there a frequency that is going to scare people? Like the roaring of a lion? I wonder, the tremor and fled. And Judah took the swords which had fallen from their hands. And Judah fought with them and slew 20 of their men upon the wall. And about 80 men and women still ascended the wall from the city and they all surrounded Judah. Can you imagine? Must have been a really wide wall to be able to surround anybody and still have some kind of distance. Surrounded Judah. And Jehovah impressed the fear of Judah in their hearts that they were unable to approach him. Notice, Jehovah is taking an active role in this battle. And Jacob and all those with him drew the bow from under the wall, and they slew ten men upon the wall, and they fell below the wall before Jacob and his sons. And the people... Upon the wall, seeing that 20 of their men had fallen, they still ran towards Judah with drawn swords. But they could not approach him, for they were greatly terrified of Judah's strength. And one of the mighty men, whose name was Arud, approached to strike Judah upon the head with his sword. When Judah hastily put his shield to his head, and the sword hit the shield. And it was split in two. And this mighty man, after he had struck Judah, ran for his life at the fear of Judah. And his feet slipped upon the well, and he, wall, and he fell among Jacob's seed, who were below the wall. And Jacob's seed smote him and slew him. And Judah's head pained him for the blow of the powerful man. From the blow of the powerful man. And Judah had nearly died from it. And Judah cried up, cried out upon the wall. Owing to the pain produced by the blow. And Dan. Dan. This is Bilhah's firstborn son. Dan and Naphtali. I think was the other one. You know I've got that. I'm going to use that as, as we talk. Because I saved that today. There it is. Dan and Naphtali is Bilhah's son. That's right. Heard him, and his anger burned within him. And he also rose up and went at a distance and ran and sprang from the earth and mounted the wall with his wrath excited strength. Did they know they could do that already? Is this the first time that they're doing that? And what are they thinking when they say, oh my gosh, I made it. And when Dan came upon the wall near to Judah, all the men upon the wall fled who had stood against Judah and they went up to the second wall. So they went down and then back up to the second wall. And they threw arrows and stones upon Dan and Judah. So now... They're on the next wall, and they're still being showered by stones and arrows. And Dan, Dan and Judah from the second wall and endeavored to drive them from the wall. And the arrows and the stones struck Dan and Judah. And they had nearly been killed upon the wall. Wherever Dan and Judah fled from the wall. So no matter where they were on the wall, they're being attacked. And they were attacked with arrows and stones from the second wall. And Jacob and his sons were still at the entrance of the city below the first wall. And they were not able to draw their bow against the inhabitants of the city as they could not be seen by them because they're on the second wall, not the first wall anymore. And Dan and Judah, when they could no longer bear the stones and the arrows that fell upon them. From the second wall, they both sprang up to the second wall near the people of the city. Oh, my gosh. So they don't have to go down and go back up. They just jumped to the next wall. And when the people of the city who were upon the second wall saw that Dan and Jacob 
Dan and Judah had come to them upon the second wall, they cried out and descended below between the walls. And Jacob and his sons heard the voice of the shouting from the on the people of the city, and they were still at the entrance of the city, and they were anxious about Dan and Judah, who were not seen by them being on the second wall. And Naphtali, so Naphtali is Dan's brother, he's watching out for his brother, went up with wrath, excited might, and sprang upon the first wall. He's doing exactly the same thing. Now three of them have done it, to see what caused the noise of the shouting which they had heard in the city. And here, and Ishakar and Zebulon. Ishakar and Zebulon are Leah's sons, the two last born. Zebulon is going to be probably the youngest one fighting in the battle right now. Uh, yeah, here. Uh, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Ishakar, Zebulon is the birth order. They all came from Leah. Uh, it says Ishakar and Zebulon drew nigh to break the doors of the city. They opened the gates of the city and came to the They opened the gates of the city. Two men, fortified gates, just tore them down. We're talking some strength here. And Naphtali leaped from the first wall to the second wall and came to his sister's brothers. And the inhabitants of Gaash who were upon the wall, seeing that Naphtali was the third who had come to assist his brothers, they fled and descended into the city. And Jacob and all his sons and all their young men came into the city to them. And Judah and Dan and Naphtali descended from the wall into the city and pursued the inhabitants of the city. And Simeon and Levi. Now we're talking about, again, no Reuben. Where's Reuben? We got the second and the third born now of, of uh, Leah. And then, I'm sorry, Ishakar and Zebulon, we were just talking about, were the uh, last born. Judah's right in the middle. And Simeon and Levi were from without the city and knew not that the gate was opened. And they went up from there to the wall and came down to their brothers in the city. They apparently made the jump too. So this is five now that have jumped the wall. Able to leap strong, strong buildings in a single bound. Again, where is Reuben? Why is Reuben not being mentioned? And the inhabitants of the city had all descended into the city. And Jacob's seed came to them in different directions. And the battle waged against them from the front and from the rear. And Jacob's seed smote them terribly and slew 20,000 of them, men and women. Not one of them could stand against Jacob's seed because they're on the wall. They can go around the back and come down, and now they got them before, before, in the front and in the back. And the blood flowed plentifully in the city, and it was like a brook of water. The blood flowed like a brook to the outer part of the city and reached the desert of Beth Karan, the house of Karan, Bet Karan, and the people of Bet Karan saw at a distance the blood flowing from the city of Gaash. And about 70 men from among them ran to see the blood. And they came to the place where the blood was. And they followed the track of the blood and came to the wall of the city of Gaash. And they saw the blood issue from the city. And they heard the voice of crying from the inhabitants of Gaash. For it ascended Unto the heaven. Heaven. Heaven is where the birds fly. Don't, don't, they're not calling out to God. This is where the birds fly. And the blood was continuing to flow abundantly like a, like a brook of water. And Jacob's seed were still smiting the inhabitants of Gaash. 
and were engaged in slaying them till evening, about 20,000 men and women. This is the same people we just talked about, 20,000. Yeah, this is the same 20,000, it seems like. And the people of Bet uh, the people of Koran, Koran, remember the house has Koran, Koranites, here they are. Uh, Beth Corin is going to be called Coronites. And the people of Corin, it must be one family. Like DDA. These would be Beth DDA. All the people of the house of DDA. May it never be. Glad it's happening to Corin, not to DDA. Surely this is the work of the Hebrews. For they are still carrying on war in all the cities of the Amorites. And those people hastened and ran to Beth Karan. The, the Kornites are going to go back to the city and each took his weapons of war. And they cried out to the inhabitants of Beth Karan, who also gird on their weapons of war to go to fight Jacob's seed. When Jacob's seed had done smiting the inhabitants of Gaash, they walked about the city to strip all the slain. And coming to the innermost part of the city, and further on, they met three powerful men. And there was no sword in their hands. And Jacob's seed came up to the place where they were. And the power, and a, the powerful man, men ran away. And one of them, Took Zebulon, the youngest, probably 13 years old, who he saw was a young lad. My notes say here, yeah, 13. Uh, and short of stature. He was the shortest one of them all as well. And with his might dashed them, dashed him to the ground, threw him on the ground. And Jacob ran to him with his sword, and Jacob smote him below the loins with his sword and cut him in two. <clears throat> and the body fell upon Zebulon. Zebulon must have been a total mess, having this man fall upon him. It's been cut in half. And the second one approached and seized Jacob to fell him to the ground. And Jacob turned to him and shouted to him, while Simeon and Levi ran and smote him with the, on the hips with the sword. And he fell on the hips with the, with the sword swords, must be both swords, felled him to the ground. And the powerful man rose up. Didn't cut him all the way through, apparently. He's still going. And the powerful man rose up from the ground with wrath, excited might. And Judah came to him before he had gained his footing and struck him upon the head with his sword, and his head was split, and he died. The third powerful man, seeing that his companions were killed, ran from before Jacob's seed, and Jacob's seed pursued him into the city. And whilst the powerful man was fleeing, he found one of the swords of the inhabitants of the city. He picked it up and turned to Jacob's seed and fought them with the sword. And the powerful man ran to Judah to strike him upon the head with the sword. And there was no shield in the hand of Judah. And whilst he was aiming to strike him, Naphtali hastily took his shield and put it up, put it to Jacob, to Judah's head. And the sword of the powerful man hit the shield of Naphtali, and Judah escaped the sword. This is the second time that uh, Jacob has been hit with a shield above his head. Remember, the first time it almost killed him. And Simeon and Levi ran. I like it. Isn't it neat how the brothers work together and protect one another? I really like that. Such camaraderie. And Simeon and Levi ran upon the powerful man with their swords and struck him powerfully with their swords. And the two swords entered the body of the powerful man and divided it in two lengthwise. And Jacob's seed smote the three mighty men at that time, together with the inhabitants of Gaash. And the day was about to decline. And Jacob's seed walked about Gaash and took all the spoil of the city, even the little ones and the women 
they did not suffer to live. So they're killing the women and the children also. Uh, this is the sixth city that they destroyed. There's still one more coming. And took all the spoil of the city, even the little ones and the women, they did not suffer to live. And the sons of Jacob did unto Gaash as they had did unto Sartan. And this says, and Shiloh. Shiloh. Where is Shiloh? Where is this coming from? I don't know. I don't know what to make of this. I thought, Kazar? Maybe it's Kazar. I don't think that's correct. Anyway, one more chapter. I do want to get through this one as well. And then we'll be kind of in line for next week. And Jacob's seed led away all the spoil of Gaash and went out of the city by night. They were going out, marching towards the castle of Bet-Karan. And the inhabitants of Karan, Bet-Karan were going to the castle to meet them. Going to the coming from the castle to meet them, I think. And that night, Jacob's seed fought with the inhabitants of Bet-Karan. In the castle of Bet Karan, the house of Bet Karan, the house, a castle, house, a castle of, a fortified house, maybe. And all the inhabitants of Bet Karan were mighty men. One of them would not flee from a thousand men. And they fought on that night upon the castle, and their shouts were heard on that night from afar. And the earth quaked at their shouting. And Jacob's seed were afraid of those men, as they were not accustomed to fight in the dark. And they were greatly confounded. And Jacob's seed cried unto Jehovah, Give us help, O Jehovah, deliver us, that we may not die by the hands of these uncircumcised men. And Jehovah hearkened to the voice of Jacob's seed. And Yahweh caused great terror and confusion to seize the people of Beth Karan. And they fought amongst themselves, the one with the other in the darkness of the night, and smote each other in great number. And Jacob's seed, knowing that Yahweh had brought a spirit of perverseness, a spirit of confusion, and terror among those men that they fought each man with his neighbor went forth from among the bands of the people of Beth Karan and went as far as the descent of the castle of Beth Karan and further. And they tarried there securely with their young men on that night. So they're going to go get a nap. And the people of Beth Karan fought the whole night. One man with his brother. You know, they're fighting each other. They know each other. These are relatives. These are neighbors. These are relatives. This is not multiple families. This is one family in particular, it sounds like. And the other with his neighbor. And they cried out in every direction upon the castle. And their cry was heard at a distance. And the whole earth shook at their voice. And they, for they were powerful above all the people of the earth. And the inhabitants of the cities of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and all the kings of Canaan. Remember, Hivites, Amorites, Hivites, Amorites, and Hivites. They're all Canaanites. And all the kings of Canaan. And also those who were on the other side of the Jordan heard the noise of the shout that night on the other side of the Jordan. Remember, Shechem is not that far from the Jordan River. Maybe some of these seven cities are on the edge of the Jordan River. It could be. And they said, surely these are the battles of the Hebrews. They call them the Hebrews. These are Hebrews. They're the ones who left the kingdom of their birth and crossed over and now serve only Yehovah. That's what a Hebrew is. Who are fighting against the seven cities who came nigh unto them. And who can stand against those Hebrews? 
Oh, this is another one from uh, the Song of David uh, as, he, as he's getting ready to pass. This is beautiful. You have delivered me from the striving of my people. You have kept me as the head of the nations. A people I have not known shall serve me. The foreigners submit to me as soon as they hear they obey me. The foreigners fade away and come frightened from their hideouts. Think about this verse, verses, as we finish the rest of this chapter. This is exactly what's going to happen. Foreigners submit to me. As soon as they hear, they obey. The foreigners fade away and come frightened from their hideouts. Yeah, watch what happens. Oh, let me shut that. And the inhabitants of the cities of the Canaanites and all those who were on the other side of the Jordan were greatly afraid of Jacob's seed, for they said, Behold, the same will be done to us as was done to those cities, for who can stand against their mighty strength? And the cries of the Coronites, there it is, the Coronites, were very great on that night and continued to increase. And they smote each other till morning, and the number and, and numbers of them were killed. And the morning appeared, and Jacob's seed rose up at daybreak and went up to the castle, and they smote those who remained of the Coronites in a terrible manner, and they were all killed in the castle. And the sixth day appeared. So now here we are, the, the sixth day. And all the inhabitants of Canaan saw a distance, saw at a distance, all the people of Bet Karan lying dead in the castle of Bet Karan and strewed about as carcasses of lambs and goats. A great slaughter. And Jacob's seed led all the spoil which, were, which they had captured from Gaash and went to Bet Karan. And they fought the city full of people like the sands of the sea. There's more people in the city that they're going to kill. And they fought with them. Jacob's seed smote them there till evening time. How much is that? Another 10,000, 20,000? Did they kill 100,000 or more uh, in these six days? And Jacob's seed did to Bet Karan as they had done to Gaash, Topnach. And they also had done to Kazar and Sartan and, Sh and to Shiloh. Again, I said they, they left out Maknema. Mak Mak is Maknema possibly Shiloh? It doesn't appear like it is. I think that's not right either. I don't know. But these are questions that we have to ask because it's just not clear. And Jacob C. took with them the spoil of Bet Karan and all the spoil of the cities. And on that day, they went home to Shechem. They're going back home. Remember, this is where they started. They came to Shechem because it had good pasture. They, it was their land. They bought it from Kamar. And the sons of Jacob came home to the city of Shechem. And they remained without the city. And they then rested. They stayed outside the city. There's a reason for this. They stay, They rested from the war and tarried there all night. And all their servants together with them, with, with all the spoil that they had taken from the cities, they left without the city, outside the city. And they did not enter the city, for, pre, for they said, pre-adventure, there may be yet more fighting against us, and they may come to besiege us in Shechem. You don't want to be besieged. You have more room to move about if you stay outside the city. And Jacob and his sons and their servants remained that night and the next day in the portion of the field which Jacob had purchased from Kamar for five shekels. Actually, it was a hundred shekels. And all they had captured was with them. And all the booty which Jacob's seed had captured was in in the portion of the fields, immense as the sands and sea. A lot of sheep, goats, cattle. That's booty. 
And the inhabitants of the land observed them from afar. And all the inhabitants of the land were afraid of Jacob's seed, who had done this thing. For no king from the days of old had ever done the like. And seven kings of the Canaanites resolved to make peace with Jacob's seed. For they were greatly afraid of their lives on account of Jacob's seed. And on that day, being the seventh day, Japhia, king of Hebron. Remember, Japhia is the king of Hebron. Hebron is the Hebrews' home base. It's where Isaac is right now. And all his people. It's where Abraham was for many years. Javia, king of Hebron, sent secretly to the king of Ai, the king of Gibeon, the king of Shalem, the king of Adul, Adulma, Adulam, the king of Lachish, the king of Kazar. I thought they killed Kazar. And to all the Canaanite kings who were under their subjection, saying, Go up with me and come to me, that we may go to Jacob's seed, and I will make peace with them and form a treaty with them, lest your land be destroyed by the swords of Jacob's seed, as they did to Shechem and the cities around it, as you have heard and seen. And when you come, do not come with many men, but let every king bring his three head captains, and each captain bring his three of his officers. Minimal amount of men. And come all of you to Hebron. Now they said seven kings. He put it out to seven kings. But we're going to see there's going to be a lot more kings than that that are going to come. And come to you. And, and, and all come to you in Hebron. And we will go together to Jacob's seed and supplicate them that they shall form a treaty of peace with us. And all those kings did as the king of Hebron had sent to them, for they were all under his counsel and command. And all the kings of Canaan assembled to go to Jacob's seed to make peace with them. And Jacob's seed returned and went to the portion of the field that was, that was in Shechem, for they did not have confidence in the kings of the land. They don't trust them. And Jacob's seed returned and remained in the portion of the field ten days. And no one came to make war with them. And when Jacob's seed saw that there was no appearance of war, they all assembled and went to the city of Shechem. And Jacob's seed remained in Shechem. At the expiration of 40 days, all the kings of the Amorites, kings of the Amorites. Why does it say Amorites and not Canaanites? All the kings of the Amorites from all their places came to Hebron, to Japhia, king of Hebron. I think it should have said Canaanites. And the number of the kings that came to Hebron to make peace with Jacob's seed was 21 kings. 21 kings. So 21 kings times three for all their captains times another nine for uh three for each of the captains, uh, gave a bunch of men. And all these kings and their men rested in by Mount Hebron. And the king of Hebron, Japhia, went out with, with his three captains and nine men. And these kings resolved to go to Jacob's seed to make peace. And they said unto the king of Hebron, Go thou before us with thy men and speak for us unto Jacob's seed. I don't even think they want to go. And we will come after thee and confirm thy word. And the king of Hebron did so. And Jacob's seed heard that all the kings of the Canaanites had gathered together and rested in Hebron. And Jacob's seed sent four of their servants as spies, saying, Go and spy these kings and search and examine their men, whether they are few or many, and if they are but few in number, number them all and come back. And the servants of Jacob, this is the Evadim, Jacob's Evadim, Jacob's servants, went secretly 
to these kings and did as Jacob's seed had commanded them. And on that day, they came back to Jacob's seed and said unto them, we have, we, we came unto the, those kings and they are but few in number. And we numbered them all. And behold, there were 288 kings and men. And Jacob's seed said, they are but few in number. Therefore, we will not, it says, we will not go out. They are but few in number. Therefore, we will not go out to them. Maybe they're going to let them come to them. Uh, let the kings come to them instead. And in the morning, Jacob's seed rose up and chose 60 men of 62 of their men and and 10 of Jacob's seed went with them. And they girt on the weapons of war, for they said they are coming to make war with us. For they knew not that they were coming to make peace with them. And Jacob's seed went out with their servants to the gate of the sh- gate of Shechem toward those kings. And, the, and their father Jacob was with them. And when they had come forth, behold, the king of Hebron and his three captains and nine men with him were coming along the road, it says, against Jacob's seed. I think this is how Jacob's seed is perceiving it right now. They're coming against us. And Jacob's seed lifted up their voice and saw the at a distance Japhia, king of Hebron. So they know the guy with his captains coming towards them. And Jacob took their stand at the place of the gate of Shechem and did not proceed. And the king of Hebron continued to advance, he and his captains, until he had come nigh to Jacob's seed. And he and his captains bowed down to the ground. And the king of Hebron, this is the king of Hebron, sat with his captains before Jacob and his sons. And Jacob's seed said unto him, What has befallen thee, O king of Hebron? Why hast thou come to us this day? What dost thou require of us? And the king of Hebron said to Jacob, I beseech thee, Adonai. My Lord, my master, this is the king talking to Jacob. All the kings of the Canaanites have this this day come to make peace with thee. And Jacob's seed heard the words of the king of Hebron, and they would not consent to his proposal, for Jacob's seed had no faith in him. For they imagined that the king of Hebron had spoken deceitfully to them. And the king of Hebron Hebron found I'm sorry, and the king of Hebron knew from the words of Jacob's seed that they did not believe his words. And the king of Hebron approached nearer to Jacob and said to him, I beseech thee, Adonai, my master, to be assured that all the kings have come to you on peaceful terms, for they have not come with all their men, neither did they bring their weapons of war with them, for they have come to seek peace from Adonai and his sons, my master and his sons. And Jacob's seed answered the king of Hebron, saying, Send thou to all these kings, if thou speakest true unto us, let them each come singly before us. And if we come, and if they come unto us unarmed, we shall then know that they seek peace from us. And Japhia, king of Hebron, sent one of his men to the kings, and they all came before Jacob's seat and bowed down to them to the ground. And these kings sat before Jacob and his sons. And they spoke unto them, saying, We have heard all that you did to the kings of the Amorites with your sword and exceedingly mighty arm, so that no man could stand before you. And we were afraid of you for the sake of our lives, lest you should befall us Thus it shall befall us as it did to them. So we have come unto you to form a treaty of peace between us. 
and now therefore contract with us a covenant of peace and truth that you will not meddle with us in as much as we have not. We will not meddle with you. And Jacob's seed knew that they had really come to seek peace from them. And Jacob's seed listened to them and formed a covenant with them. Makes me wonder if we're supposed to form a covenant with the heathen. Maybe that's what we do. And Jacob's seed wrote, swore unto them that they would not meddle with them. And all the kings of the Canaanites swore that they swore also to them. And Jacob's seed made them tributary. So they are going to pay tribute now every year to Jacob and his seed from this day forward. Puts a whole new light on Jacob in the land of Canaan. You have to wonder what was going on. You know, in Torah, it just simply says the fear of the of, of Jacob and his seed were on the Canaanites or the Amorites. Amorites and Perizzites, I think it says. But that doesn't really tell us much. What was the relationship between Jacob and and his seed and the Canaanites from there on. Now we have a better idea what it was and why it was. It makes a difference. And after this, all the captains of the kings came with their men before Jacob with presents in their hands for Jacob and his sons. And they bowed down to him to the ground. And these kings urged Jacob's seed and begged them to return the spoil that they had captured from the seven cities of the Amorites. Look what it also says. And the sons of Jacob did so, and they returned all that they had captured. The women, the little ones, the cattle. Remember that I said, that's the booty. And all the spoil which they had taken, and they sent them off, and they went away, each one to his city. And all the kings again bowed down to Jacob's seed, and they sent and brought them many gifts in those days. And Jacob's seed sent off these kings and their men, they went peacefully away from them to their cities. And Jacob's seed also returned to their home to Shechem. And there was peace from that day forward between Jacob's seed and the kings of the Canaanites until Israel's seed came to inherit the land of Canaan. Well, keep in mind, there was 219 years between the time that uh, Israel, no, Jacob, well, Israel, Israel and his sons, the 70, went into, into Egypt. There was 210 years until they came back out. I know many people will say it was 430 years. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't, they haven't figured it out. They haven't checked it out. Well, next week, we're going to talk about, remember, we're still, Jake, Jacob went to his dad when he was 100 years old. All this happened when they were 105 years, when Jacob was 105 years old. Now Jacob's going to be in the 110th year, and we're going to start talking about Joseph and his brothers, the coat of many colors, and how that's going to fit into Genesis 37. It's coming next week. Uh, I think you're going to find it extremely interesting to see how this all fits together. It really changes our understandings and gives us better knowledge and deepens our understanding. I think that knowledge and understanding is going to create wisdom in us for the future. Well, I'll say goodbye. Thank you for joining me today, and we'll see you next time.